Hi, this is Eric Walker, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. The show that makes you wonder how those Ewoks just happen to have a Princess Leia size dress laying around. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Redshirt crewman number 93. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins Wicket in the quest to find the parents of Sindel and Mace, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope, because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his life monitor. And now, a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savory. Their link can be found in the show notes. So our guest today is the actually the first mace in the Star Wars universe. Long before that guy Windu wielded the purple lightsaber in the prequel series, our guest traveled to the forest mood of Endor with his sister and the Ewoks at his side to search for their parents. Everyone, let's welcome Eric Walker to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure being here with you. And I just uh, got off the shuttle from uh, the forest moon of Endor, and I'm joining you on your wonderful, funny science fiction podcast. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. So, Eric, a lot of times because we're nerds, we like to talk to our guests about their origins and their background stories and because every superhero should have a good origin story. So we'd love to talk to you about the, your beginnings in the entertainment business. What were your influences when you were a young man that that influenced your acting and shaped your desire to be an entertainer that eventually led you to joining the Star Wars universe? That's a good question. That's a good question. Well, it, for me, it happened by chance. I was playing uh, Pop Warner football, which is tackle football, not tag, and uh, was on the farm team. I think I was like six or seven years old. And these uh, ad representatives came out and uh, they wanted to use a football team in a, in a commercial. I didn't know it at the time, but later it was a Jack in the Box commercial. So I, the very first thing I ever did was, you know, jumping out of a van in a football uh, outfit, you know, and running into Jack in the Box. And uh, they didn't want to hire soccer players. So the later they had us change. So I played a soccer player as well. But <laughs> that's, but what I liked the most about it was I said, wow, I just got paid all this money. And I also got free Jack in the Box food. So I thought it was the greatest job ever. And I kept saying to my dad, they fed me Jack in the Box food and they paid me $300 for the day. Wow. And this is back in 60, 76, 77. So that's a lot of money per day back then. Oh, yeah. Being a precocious kid and uh, my dad not thinking I was serious, he just probably thought I wanted to have more Jack in the Box food. He, <laughs> he did not let me get into acting. He just said, no, 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 no. And I just kept pestering him. And I really thought it was something I wanted to do. And he, he had told me that my mother really wanted to, us to become actors because we lived in uh, Sherman Oaks, which is a suburb a uh, little bit north of Hollywood in the Los Angeles area in the San Fernando Valley. And my mom always wanted us, you know, it was her dream to see her kids be actors. And unfortunately she was a, a she did see the commercial, but she died later, like the next year. So, and that weighed heavy on me. I know, I know this is a funny podcast, but. Um, That's okay. So I pestered my dad for years and years and years. And finally he goes, you're not going to give this up, are you? I go, no, I'm not. So after about two or three years of doing that, my sister, um, you know, because we're in the entertainment capital of the world in Los Angeles and Hollywood, she went to school with uh, some some uh, a girl who was an actress already. I think she was one of the original Pippi Longstockings. And mm -hmm. she got an agent's phone number from a couple of agents phone numbers from her. And she called uh, the agent and told the agent about me and set up an interview. And because of my sister doing that, and my dad, me pestering my dad. I met with an agent. Her name is Beverly Heck. She, she goes, I like him. Well, go ahead and give it a shot. And she signed me. And that was about 1980. 
And then uh, I studied, uh, didn't get anything for a little bit. Then she said, well, maybe we should have you study acting. You know, most kids have some sort of natural ability, but I didn't seem to have that much natural ability. I had to really fight and study and work hard to become a, a good actor. And okay. so um, after she, she, she sent me to an acting workshop and I learned how the art of cold reading and how to get a job. And after studying for about a year, I started getting work, uh, just small parts. I was on, uh, I did a movie of the week with called having it all, which was a dying Canon. I played her nephew. And then I did, I was on Webster. You remember Webster in the eighties? Oh yeah. Very much. So, so. I, I played the football player again just like in the Jack in the Box commercial. So that was fun. <laughs> and um, just, just, it just started to do that. And then after about three or four years of doing that, that's when I got the call to go on the audition that changed my life. It gave me the first, uh, the, my first starring role, which was in, uh, at the time, it was called the Ewok movie when we were making it. Also the Ewok holiday special. And right. then later they changed the name to the Ewok adventure. And now it's called Caravan of Courage. Um, that's all a long story. We could talk for an hour about that, but that's how I got started. And then, uh, you know, George saw me and picked me for Mace. I am the original Mace. I'm sorry, Sam Jackson. Uh, he did not use your name before mine. I am the original Mace. There you go. So we all love stories. One of the stories we don't get to hear that often is the behind the scenes. So what were some of your favorite behind the scene moments in the Ewok movie? Well, I mean, besides the fact that everybody uh, got uh, poison ivy, which wasn't very comfortable. So that oh, was no. like, yeah, almost everybody was getting, you know, get, got it good. I didn't get it, uh, but almost literally everybody got it. That the uh, forest moon of Endor has a lot of poison ivy. So we had to be careful <laughs> doing that. Um, other than that, Warwick Davis and I, um, Warwick had a video camera he brought with him from England. We were going to school at that time because uh, we we're still in school. It was right before the summer break. So the teacher thought it'd be a good idea for Warwick Davis and myself to do, since we're interested in filmmaking and he had a camera, she got the producer, Tom Smith, to get us another video camera. And so we, she thought it, so we did a making of like a behind the scenes. Uh, oh, cool. about us doing the movie. And we have about two two hours of footage, which nobody's ever seen. We interviewed the director, J uh, John Cordy, the producer. We ran around the set. One day I was recording when uh, George Lucas showed up with uh, Linda Ronstadt. He was dating her at the time. He brought his daughter. Uh, his daughter just had her first day of preschool. So he asked all the uh, the little people like Warwick Davis if they could, because uh, she had never seen an Ewok with its head off. So the rule was you got to put the heads on and give her gifts, but don't please don't take the heads off because she thinks Ewoks are real. <laughs> there you go. We had a lot of fun. I almost asked you for a second there if you, and then I had realized who you're talking about if you meant Linda Ronstadt or his daughter. So, but I'm with you now. I, I tracked it. We're oh, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah In no, my brain, just, it was Linda Ronstadt going, oh, wow, they're real. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She was really cool. She was a really cool person. I was like freaking out because I, I uh, saw her at the rap party after we finished doing the uh, Ewok movie. And she walked right up to me and said, Eric, I heard you're doing a great job. And I like, she knows my name. She remembered me. <laughs> Linda Ronstadt remembered me. Well, sure. Yeah. And at that time, she was really big. Yeah. You know? So, it's, yeah. yeah, she was. So, it yeah, was very a, it popular. Was a yep. All right. So, Talking about music, you're also a musician and uh, with songs about Star Wars and other sci-fi related themes on, on one of your YouTube channels. Now, uh, I believe this is your latest offering. It's called Dare to Dream in a Galaxy Far, Far Away. Uh, if you don't mind, would you take a moment to talk about how you create your music, what your inspiration is behind it? And if I'm not mistaken, what it was like to sell, uh, perform that at Star Wars Celebration this year? Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah, Dare to Dream in a Galaxy Far, Far Away obviously is inspired by my my work in Star Wars. Uh, a lot of uh, my style of music is kind of like uh, EDM. It's electronic dance music. And um, I had had some instrumental stuff before, before we wrote this song. And I got together with a good friend of mine. His name is Buddy Mix. And we created a character called ACM, which stands for Alpha Centauri Man. So there's a whole story behind that and how he... he how on his planet uh, in Alpha Centauri system, they really believed that the Ewok movies were documentaries. And he came, he came to our planet to try to find out what happened to Mace because he saw the, and he, 
at the end, second movie, the HUD exploded and he wondered what happened. Although he came here and realized he came in the wrong time. So he's dealing with a grown up Mace and we became friends. We started writing music and his whole goal is to, we're to our whole goal in the mu music that we create is to uh, bring in a, a awareness and try to help enlighten this world and uh, not take everything too seriously. And uh, Dare to Dream is just uh, like, just like, you know, in Star Wars, Star Wars really helps us, uh, you know, gets us out of the mood and it dares us to, you know, dream that we can make everything happen. And that's the whole concept behind that song. And we were able to perform it at Star Wars Celebration, thanks to Richard and Sarah Woloski. They, they're, they're skywalking through Neverland. They were on the podcast stage, so we were able to do that. But that, that song, by the way, was from our prior album. And we did a music video as well that's online. People, your viewers could watch. If you search on YouTube, Dare to Dream in a Galaxy Far, Far Away, you could find the music video we did. And I, and I, I dressed as Mace again, and we had a lot of fun making it. But our latest album that just came out is called Trust Yourself. And uh, that's our second CD. It's available everywhere. I'm working on a music video right now uh, for the first single called Proud of It, which sounds like a song that should be uh, in Star Wars 2. It sounds like something uh, Rex would probably mm -hmm. spin in Oga's Cantina. In fact, the video was shot uh, with a bat where uh, it looks like we're in Olga's Cantina. <laughs> uh, we'll see when it gets released. But that's coming out in a few weeks uh, called Proud of It. But yeah. The, the, my music is definitely inspired by whatever happens in my life, you know, and of course, Star Wars is a big part of it. So is other sci-fi stuff. Like you mentioned earlier, we're, we're nerds. We like, I like everything sci-fi. Uh, mm -hmm. Star Wars, of course, is the best, but Star Trek is great. I love Stargate. I like, I just like everything, a little bit of everything. You know, because we had mentioned that there there were some other sci-fi related themes on that channel, the things that you had made music about. So what are some other sci-fi themes that people could expect to find with your music? The, there's a song called Will I Be Ready? There's a song called uh, Trust Yourself, which is about trusting your gut and your instinct and, and go with the flow. Everything is just kind of has a nice, it's kind of uplifting. It's uh, If you want to listen to our music, it, it helps. It's very atmospheric. It's dancey. It's catchy. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna make you, uh, make you feel good. And that's what I'm about. I'm about spreading love and joy. And, and that's, that's what we're about. Perfect. Well, there's not enough of that in this world right now, it seems. So we'll take it. Yeah, that's true. We'll take all that we can get. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I have checked out the, the dare to dream and a few other songs and, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty cool. I think what I, I put them out while I was doing research for, uh, this episode and I was looking into stuff about, all, you know, all things Eric Walker, I kind of put uh, the playlist on on uh, on YouTube and just kind of let them play. So and just kind of got went through a bunch of your songs uh, all at once. So it was kind of kind of a nice way to do it. it Help me, I think, kind of get a, a, a feeling for what you were reaching for, or maybe, and some of the the and things that you were you were leaning towards uh, when it came to right. your music creation. Sure. So. And, and, bef and before that, before I started collaborating with ACM, most of my stuff was just instrumental. And my inspiration behind that stuff was like, you know, Tangerine Dream, Jean-Michel Jarre, Vangelis. The, so if you go back and listen to my first three albums, uh, which are Tangier Dream, um, Universal Delight, and Brand New Day, I was actually up for a Grammy for Brand New Day, his best new age album. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So I was oh, very proud of that. Well, you should uh, be. But, That's fantastic. Yeah. So it was, it was a big honor. So, um, and, and we'll see what happens with this new stuff. We're just going to push it. Uh, but if you go back and if, if you need to escape this world, go listen to the instrumental stuff too. So we all tend to have something that we like to hold dear and close to our hearts. What was a project or something that you hold close to your heart that may not be a little, that is a little less known? I did a project for, for the homeless many, many years ago and I worked with Volunteers of America. Uh -huh. And that's a bigger, that problem is just magnified now because of COVID. That project, the, the project was called Miracle Alley. And I, I played the part of this kind of a Scrooge type character named George Peabody, who uh, was trying to run off the homeless out of this area that they call Miracle Alley, where miracles happen every year on Christmas. And I would love to see that. We did a short version of that, but I'd love to see it more developed and get that out there. I think that'd be a great piece. No, I think that's a really good idea. I like it when when there are stories put out there that it may be something where it, it may smack the person in the face at first, you know, when they're, you know, is whatever the topic may be, especially when it is so for the topic of homelessness, 
you know, right. they, they, that may smack them in the face at first and they go, oh yeah, this is what it's about. But I love it when they can take that at the same time and it smacks them in the face, but at the, at the same time, it, it kind of runs at an even keel right after that and gets them thinking about the product or the, not the product, but the problem rather. And sure what's going on and, and, you know, and then having, it's, it's real easy to say, yeah, homelessness is bad and that these things are bad and these things need to end and, you know, whatever else, but you know, it's, it's a, a very often a, an overlooked conversation that not a lot of people have. And I think that it's something that, you know, if you can spark that interest with something like, like with the project, the project you were describing, I think it helps gets that into the mind, the consciousness of people and it gets it out there where they're able to talk about it and have the conversation. Yeah, that's that's very good points. All very good points. You're right. That's it's it's been a topic. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we filmed this and a long time ago. And I'd like to bring it back up. But yeah, I agree. So back in 2006, I think it is was uh, it looks according to IMDb and now IMDb is never uh, infallible. Uh, sometimes they have things in there that aren't supposed to be there. And sometimes they have things that are incorrectly put or dated or things along those lines. But according right. to IMDb, uh, in 2006, it said you stepped away from acting uh, for a while. And but it's then it says in 2014, you were participating in a, a special about the making of the Ewok adventures. So what led you to step away from acting in 2006? And what took your attention over at that time? Well, I mean, they're they're sort of correct, but not totally correct. And, I, and of course, yes, IMDb it only has half my credits on, listed on there. They don't have a lot of credits that I did on there. So they're not, like you said, they're, they're, they're sometimes they're right. Sometimes people add stuff. Um, I had actually stepped away from acting a lot longer than that. I mean, I, I stepped away from acting to pursue other things in, in business in the late nineties, not, not in 2000, the, not in 2000, <laughs> like they said. Oh, I gotta love IMDb. Yeah. The only reason why I have a credit in the 2000 is because there was a gentleman who runs who uh, is a, like a, a filmmaker, and he asked me to do a small role as a detective in a, a, a movie he was making. Really great gentleman. He talked me into it. I was attending. He was one of his conventions in Ohio, and he paid me a lot of money to do that role, and I enjoyed it. And I, I enjoyed coming back and getting back into acting, and I, I liked it, actually, again. Um, but sometime around the mid to late 90s, I realized that my passion was other things, and I didn't really... I was busy, uh, you know, editing and, and doing these documentaries about uh, different uh, that I was being paid to do. And I moved away more to the behind the scenes stuff. And that, you know, okay. I love editing. I work on I work on a program called Avid. And some of your viewers might know it, but actually George Lucas developed Avid. It was originally called Editroid. So it's a very coincidence. And then that that making of I don't know how that got up there, but we've not done anything with the making of. I don't know why it's listed that as a 2014. I know that I posted something on YouTube showing like a snippet, like a teaser of some of the footage we have. And maybe IMDb grabbed that and thought we released it. But we haven't released anything on the making of stuff. Disney is looking at some of the footage right now and maybe something may come of it, but maybe nothing will come of it. But they they have they've had they have told us they're interested in at least looking at the footage and then we'll find out if they want to use it. OK, mm -hmm. well, yeah, that, you know, IMDb, like I said, it's it's not infallible. And and uh, this is not the first time where we've sat down with somebody and said, hey, according to IMDb, you've got this project <laughs> going. And how about this? And how about that? And they're like, yeah, no, no, not not so much. <laughs> uh, it would be cool if Disney did take that footage and, and did something with it. I would I think that would be. Uh, especially for kids who were uh, around the age group where that when those shows were coming out and around right. the time of uh, Return of the Jedi, it's kind of a cool look back on that whole time frame as to, you know, you know, it's it's the memory lane. It is. It is. And not just that, but the, like they're doing right now with the Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett. And, you know, they do those Disney galleries behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could up they could do that with the Ewok movies now that they're on Disney Plus and we could do other stuff for it. Like they could interview myself. They could interview Warwick Davis. They could interview the producer, get mm -hmm. some talk about what, why George did it, why he made those movies back then and, and update it. And then they could use our footage as well. I mean, they could do a whole behind like a Disney gallery. Yeah. I would love it if they did that. Yeah. The gallery stuff is really cool. It would be neat to see that and hear. 
and I, you know, I love the gallery for the Mandalorian and, and, and the, mm-hmm. the, the interviews with the creatives, the creatives behind that. So yes. it would be really cool to see that and, and hear that, um, you know, what the thought process was going into the making of, of the Ewok adventures or Caravan of Courage or the Ewok movie, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it right now. But I would, I would actually enjoy that. I think that would be a lot of fun because right. it's, it's looking back at a, it's a time capsule, right? You know, being able to look back. It is. And originally we were signed to do a trilogy. So we were supposed to do a third movie that just hmm. that did that. I believe a script was written. So at least got to the stage where they wrote one script. Okay. I haven't seen it, but I know that much. Interesting. OK, that's more than I knew. So, hey, I'm cool. Yeah. You, you know, so I did go back and watch the great Ewok adventure caravan of courage. And I just realized Tim's earlier statement about where did they have a dress for Leia just lying around? Well, it was the mother. Like she could have totally had a dress that was there. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you believe if you believe that, then that's another debate with canon and all the fodder with people out there. Because uh, someone in the expanded universe wrote a book and put Sindel in it, and in his book he put the Ewok movies between uh, a, a New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. But when we were making the movie, the producer told us that it took place over a hundred something years after the battle for Endor. In fact, in one in Bantha tracks, the official fan club magazine, he's the producer talks about how when Sindel and them are having that scene where they're doing the star cruiser crash thing, one of the uh, little toys is, a, is an ATST on, on the table. And he, he talks about it in Bantha tracks, but again, whatever you believe, I don't care. I, I think it's a good idea if it did happen. Uh, like that, like that expanded universe writer wrote it. But then again, why do the Ewoks kind of understand basic and you know, no, and they're able to talk to us if they hadn't already went through something? Right. Yeah. There you go. Interesting. So personally, I would love to see like a continuation of like Sindel and Mace, like bring them back. Um, I do like how uh, Disney is kind of deviating a little bit from the mm-hmm. Skywalker saga. Where would you like to see Sindel and Mace end up? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think, well, not just Sindel and Mace, I think that the Ewoks, not just uh, Sindel and Mace are characters, but I think the Ewoks deserve their own Disney Plus series. Um, and I would love to work on that. And since I know so much about the Ewok movies participating in them, I think I would be a good you know, good, good producer if they, if they would like to develop something. But I think, I think maybe we could talk a little bit about maybe show what happened to Sindel and maybe Mace didn't die because maybe uh, his, maybe his family had something that, because I don't believe Mace died. I think he, he was instantly transported off the planet and that's why his life monitor went out. I don't think he died. I think okay. he did, something happened, and that's my opinion. And I think that Sindel, of course, we know she left with that hermit Noah, and we know the mother and father for sure died, so they're they're dead. But I don't think I would I would think it would be good if Mace. You see a little bit of what happens to Mace, what happens to Sindel, but I think a, a series that's focused on the Ewoks and their adventures, and maybe pre Empire, would be nice before the Empire built the shield generator, maybe see you know do a little show about that and why did the empire decide to build the shield shield generator is there a reason behind that i think i I think we could i think it'd be good if we could develop something but we'll see Uh, who knows we'll see what happens i think there's a ton of stories that are that are available between empire and jedi yeah as to what's going on and and you know and and the stories of of mace and sindel would fit in very well in that time frame as to and like you said why did the empire choose endor why why are they building on Endor? What was the purpose of of having that that assortment there? Right, and I think Warwick Davis would be a good producer too. He should produce it since he knows everything he walks too. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's got a he's got a depth of knowledge on that for sure. Not that he wants to get in that costume where you know he can't see and he's blind <laughs> ten seconds after he puts a head on. That explains a, a few of the things I I saw. Like it, it seemed like the Ewoks like stumbled often well they, they they couldn't see i mean the second they put those heads on within five seconds it was all fogged up and the the actors were so good because it was like their count they had to they had to actually count the steps to know where to go so they wouldn't fall over oh man it was hard it was hard for them they were troopers sounds like it for sure 
All right, Eric, you also have a, uh, a YouTube show called All for Sci-Fi uh, with just under 16,000 members, I do believe, if I saw if, uh, if my count was correct last I checked. But if you would, let's talk about that show for a moment. If you could tell us how it started, what you cover on that channel, what people could expect from your show. It is a fairly new uh, thing that I started. Um, it was around the time, like right, uh, probably just before COVID or right around that time. And uh, so we have not been on, we've not been on that long. It's been a couple of years, I think, you know, I had been on a lot of different podcasts for, because of my involvement in star Wars. And I noticed that in, in fandom in general, everybody seems to have like, they're all, they're all star Wars podcast or all star Trek podcast are all each fandom tends to stay within their own realm. And I thought, why? I mean, I love all of science fiction. And I said, wait a minute, all for sci-fi, because I love all sci-fi. And that's sure. how I, so that's what all for sci-fi is about. It's not just about Star Wars. It's not just about Star Trek or Marvel or DC movies or comic books. It's about everything sci-fi, everything fantasy related, space operas, you name it. We're sure. going to talk about everything. And that's, uh, that's, and we do a weekly webcast and, I have a sidekick that's always, he's kind of a goofball. We call him Captain Rickster. And we go back and forth with each other. And um, that's what that's all about. So every week we do, we're reviewing the latest thing. Like not right now we're doing star, a lot of the Star Trek stuff uh, that just came out, Strange New Worlds. We're talking about that. We're going to be talking about Stranger Things. We're going to be talking about uh, the new season two of the Bureau of Magical Things. We're going to be talking mm -hmm. about that soon. Uh, Jurassic Park, we're going to be reviewing that tomorrow at 3 o'clock. So it's every Saturday at 3 o'clock. And then when, whenever we hit major milestones, we have giveaways, like free toys. Uh, I don't know Perfect. if anybody's able to see it, but you see all the Star Wars toys behind me. We're gonna, it's free giveaways. We just – there you go. We just sent uh, – we just actually sent uh, something to London. We have viewers all over the world. And a nice. gentleman, one of, one, he won the record. We gave away the six inch black series of Wrecker. So we just Ooh. sent that to him. More it costs more to send it to London than it did to buy the thing. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. We've we've shipped a few things to uh, New Zealand and Australia. And yeah. the uh the shipping cost was like, oh my, okay. <laughs> Would have been cheaper just to send him a gift card. Exactly. Yeah. Keep our word. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, you you've got a you've got a pretty interesting show there. I've I've watched a few episodes and uh um, I think we subscribed with this channel with our, yeah, I'm pretty sure we subscribed. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll, so we've been, we've we'll been watching. Back too. All right. <laughs> but yeah. So we've been, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been catching up on it and, and, uh, I like the, that's one of the things I liked about your show. And, and it's one of the things that we, we kind of do here too, is that it's not just, I mean, we talk a lot about star Wars, but we also talk a lot about star Trek. We talk a lot about, you know, like today's guest is from Stargate, you know, last week's was from Marvel animation and, and, you know, nice. you know, so it's a little bit of everything. I know there's guys out there who specialize in the, and that's great, but I, you know, we're like you, we like all of it and we want to talk about all of it. Yeah, no, your name, you, you, you have a unique name, you know, FS, F podcast. So it's all about science fiction and being funny. And it's some, ours is just all for sci-fi and we're goofballs too. And, um, just, uh, it's just, uh, and I just got back from Germany. I don't know if you know that, but I, I, was at, I did see that. Yeah. I was at FedCon. So, I mean, I'm a big Star Trek fan. So I, you know, I'm, I'm standing next to Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spinner and I'm watching them do all their comic timing. And Michelle Hurd was there and my new favorite, uh, Ian Alexander was there from the card and, uh, the, um, the guy who played Elnor from the card was there too. And I'm like freaking out because I'm big fans of theirs as well. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I, I honestly, for me, I just recently got into Trek. I'm, mm -hmm. I grew up kind of like avoiding Trek. I'm like, Oh, it's all too serious. It's, and so, you know, these, my, my co-hosts always pick on me that I treated <laughs> it like the plague. Uh, but I started watching strange new worlds and that has opened all these pardon the pun but these strange new worlds for me you know what tim though if you like strange new worlds and you like the original because this is the stuff that they've been releasing lately has not been like star trek they've been going off and veering off in these weird things with discovery and picard but strange mm -hmm. new worlds reminds me of the next generation and the original trek so if you like strange new world you're you should go back and watch the original i already started actually 
good. I'm I'm on episode eight, I think it is, of season one. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So I've been I, every week when I try to watch one or two episodes a week in between everything else I'm watching and doing for this show and and everything else, you know. And then there's the real life that comes and kicks me in the rump every now and then. But sure. But yeah, so I, I have very much been enjoying it. It's, it's been a ton of fun. I've even found, you know, one of the reasons I, I think a long time ago why I didn't like Star Trek is because I didn't all, I didn't keep in mind the fact that this show was made in the 60s and the the, the technology that was made and available at that time, you know, and because I, I was comparing it to Star Wars and all these other different things. And I wanted the, the laser swords and the explosions and all these different things that I was used to with Star Wars. Now I, I really enjoy the storylines going back. And now I watch it and I'm going, man, you know, for the 60s, this was actually pretty technologically advanced. This is pretty amazing what they're, you know, what they're what they're putting on screen. Well, not just that, but if you go back and watch those episodes, they predicted a lot of stuff that became true, like with cell phones, uh, sure. iPads, all that stuff. Oh, like, yeah. Well, kind of so, scary, yeah. actually. It, it, it well, makes you wonder, huh? It does. It does. <laughs> So we're going to end our list of questions with the semi silliest silly ish question. Uh, where would you like to visit, whether it be sci-fi or in real life? Like, where would you like to take a vacation? I think probably Naboo. I'd like to take a vacation there. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I hear the poison ivy is worse there. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I better be careful, right? <laughs> but there's... There's not very much sand. You don't have to worry about it getting in and everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, Eric, we're at the stage in our show where we like to take each one of our guests through a quiz. Okay. All right, and so this is four quiz, four questions entitled A Walker Through the Park. Uh, we're going to ask you four questions. Each question is multiple choice. And if you get three of the four questions correct, we want to send you this book right here entitled Custodians of the Cosmos, written by Drayton Allen. It's all about someone who wanted to join something quite like Starfleet, but not Starfleet, you know, for litigious reasons. And uh, the, the gentleman, uh, the, the lead character, washed out of the Starfleet-style fe federation, and but rejoined as a custodian so he could boldly clean up after those who had boldly just went. <laughs> so if you get three of the four questions correct, we'll send you that book, okay? Okay, fair If enough. you get two or less questions correct, we take your picture, we make a meme out of you, and we insert you into our... 204,000 member Facebook group. We call it our fun sequence. <laughs> so, but if you, that happens, you're in, you're in good company. Dan Pavenmeyer from Phineas and Ferb is, is a meme recipient and a few other actors as well. So you'll be, you'll be in good company. Do you agree sure. to that? Yes, I do. All right. Let's have some fun. Nick, take us out. In the Ewok language, yup, dumb translates to what? Is it hooray? Tastes good? Or more, please. It's, it's the first one you said, I think. Hooray. You are correct. Number two, the Ewok language is based on what real world language? Is it Chinese, Korean, or Tibetan? I hope you did your research because it's based on several different languages. The actual Ewok language was developed by, um, if you watch Caravan of Courage, you could, the, the lady's name is on there who developed the Ewok, at least in a theatrical version. But uh, let me try to answer it based on the questions you gave me, and then I'll tell you what we were told. But what was okay. your use of Tibetan and what? All right. So according to the, uh, the, the source that I had said it was, uh, it could have been Chinese, Korean, or Tibetan. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go with uh, Chinese. But um, I was told that it was a combination of Filipino ta uh, Tagalog and had Vietnamese in it as well. And I believe Chinese, but what did your source say? Our source said Tibetan. Tibetan. Okay. But we're gonna we're gonna wipe that one <laughs> from the uh, the questions. We're gonna go with the actor who was actually in the movie, not the, the guy who was writing something on the internet. So, all right, Nick, go ahead and ask question three. According to reports, you are often mistaken for who on the set of Caravan of Courage: Harrison Ford, Peter Mayhew, or Mark Hamill. Our camel. All right, there's two. Which of the following is an Ewok swear word? Lerdo, Feech, or Rhoda? I'm going to say Lerdo, probably. According to our source, it was Feech. Well, Feech is kind of like, um, I believe Feech is like um, 
really? I don't, because uh, Wicked says Feige a couple times, but it, he didn't seem like he was swearing when he said it. You go back and watch it. But the couple times when they were mad at me, they like, like, because I did something, mm-hmm. they went, they went like, Lairdo. Like they were mad, <laughs> like they were mad at me. <laughs> All right. Well, again, we're going to go with the actor. So, uh, hey, you won the book. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but there were good questions. I'm really, you guys did your homework. Um, try. But I, you know, uh, watch the movie, watch Caravan of Who is, watch it again. And they, they say both those uh, in Caravan of Courage, by the way. Yeah, which is why I included them. Well, I mean, I think if I remember correctly, uh, Wicked says it like he says the word Fiege like in the very beginning, like when he's upset that his, his dad won't let him go with them. And okay. he says it. So watch it there. And you could decide if you think that, that he was saying it because he was a swear word, but okay. I can tell you this, when they say the word Lairdo, they're pissed off at me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're going to go with what you say, because that may actually okay. makes a whole lot of sense. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and what you are working on? Well, the quickest way to uh, to find me is just go to my official website, which is ericwalkermusic.com. All right, guys, we want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to ensure that we get more amazing guests like Eric Walker here today. And we get to have these fun uh, conversations for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It's going to help out well more than we can ever really tell. And we want to make sure that you go check out Eric's work and subscribe to his All for Sci-Fi channel as well. You're going to love it. A lot of cool stuff going on over there. But if for some reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department, the Ewok Wicket. That fuzzy little Ewok is sure to get enough trouble on his own along the way, but he's also resourceful enough to make sure that the offending parties are dealt with in a timely manner. And whatever you do, don't underestimate his cuteness. Ewoks are still bears, or something close to bears. And if they were going to eat Luke and Han in Return of the Jedi, so yeah, there's that. So if you're going to complain, please do so responsibly. No one wants to get killed by a knee-high murder bear. Thanks again, Eric. My pleasure, That was fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us for FSF Popcast. Goodbye. Subscribe. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF Popcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode.